In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. I'd like to welcome you all from your homes, your rooms, wherever you are, to Murray Hill Place, where in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, we want to spend these minutes praying this evening, this evening recollection. We'll go from 7.15 to 8.35 with two meditations. The second, this meditation will end at 7.35. We'll have five minutes for prayer. And then the talk at 7.40. Then at 7.55, an examination of conscience. And 8.05, final meditation by Father Javier with the closing benediction with blessing from our Lord for you and your families. And there's a moment now to shut the door of your room. I know it's hard with little ones running around the house, but try to get that quiet for this next hour or so. Turn off the other applications on your computer, the other distractions that might come, and try to listen but also to speak to our Lord, to say daring things to our Lord, to ask him things, to really make good use of this time to listen, to speak to our Lord. We've just celebrated the Feast of Pentecost, and we all know that wonderful scene, 50 days after the resurrection, when the Holy Spirit the third person of the Blessed Trinity, floods into the world and makes all things new. When Pentecost Day came round, we read from the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles had all met in one room, when suddenly they heard what sounded like a powerful wind from heaven, the noise of which filled the entire house in which they were sitting. And something appeared to them that seemed like tongues of fire. And these separated and came to rest on the head of each of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak foreign languages as the Spirit gave them the gift of speech. Now there were devout men living in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. And at this sound they all assembled each one bewildered to hear these men speaking in his own language. They were amazed and astonished. Surely, they said, all these men speaking are Galileans. How does it happen that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus of Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, as well as visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them preaching in our own language about the marvels of God. The Holy Spirit gives life to the church on this day of Pentecost by giving sanctifying power to the sacraments, the power to make us holy, divinized, sharing in God's own divine life as a gift from you, Lord, the first fruits from your cross, that you and the Father sent the Holy Spirit into the world to renew the face of the earth. The Holy Spirit gives us that sanctifying power such that when the priest says those words of consecration over that bread and wine, they become your body and your blood for us. When the priest gives absolution and confession, sins are forgiven through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God's grace returns to our hearts. By baptism, we receive God's life, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our souls. What is sanctifying power? 
It makes us holy by giving us a share in God's divine life. We become sons and daughters of God through sharing in the life of Jesus himself. He is our head, we are the members, we make one mystical body. And we become, best of all, heirs to glory. We have a right to heaven if we have God's life inside of us, if we belong to that divine family. But I'd like to stop at this moment here in this meditation with our Lord to say, I ask myself and ask you in the presence of God, what does Pentecost mean to me? And I don't just mean Pentecost 2,000 years ago, but what does Pentecost 2020 mean to me? When the people who heard St. Peter speak on that day 2,000 years ago heard him explain the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, they asked him, what must we do? And now in 2020, here in our Lord's presence, we've just celebrated Pentecost. And we are those people gathered outside when the Spirit comes. And we ask, what is the Holy Spirit asking of us? of me, this Pentecost. Let's turn to the Holy Spirit who resides within us in grace. We're not alone if God resides within us. We can ask in this time of prayer, Lord, what do you want of me? Like those people asked at that first Pentecost. We have to ask it to us, our Lord now. Pentecost 2020, Lord, what do you want us to do? St. Peter tells them, repent and be baptized. And at the end of his discourse, he says, save yourself from this corrupt generation. The Holy Spirit has come to raise up a generation of sons and daughters of God to be light in a dark generation. And you and I are called to be that light in this generation. And that's what our Lord is looking at us and asking us to do. This is our mission as Christians, as Catholics. Years ago, St. Jose Maria wrote in The Way, a secret, an open secret. These world crises are crises of saints. God wants a handful of men and women of his own. In every human activity, and then Pax Christi and Regno Christi, then the peace of Christ will come in the kingdom of Christ. We can ask ourselves, very fitting these days, why does there continue to be so much violence in our society? Why do innocent people continue to suffer unjustly? Why is there so much smoldering hatred in people's hearts, distrust, division among people? And obviously there will always be legitimate differences and points of view, but the deep divisions and hatreds are the result of sin in the world and sin in men's hearts. And as long as there's sin allowed to grow, we're going to lose this peace that God has come to bring. We cannot expect to build a society of peace when sin reigns in hearts. And if we're caught up in sinful practices, sinful behavior, it creates a sinful generation. And we can't expect people to live Christian charity with each other, understanding, forgiveness, if they don't turn to God and repent of their sins. And so we ask our Lord, forgive me for my sin. Help me to change. Help me to root out of my life what needs to be rooted out of my life, bad habits, bad dispositions, bad practices that don't belong in my life, but I can't do it without your help. 
St. Jose Maria used to say that sin divides, but love unites. And as long as there's sin dominating the world, there's going to be division. But love brings people together, forgives, understands, unites. On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit made everyone hear the apostles speaking in their own languages. It was the opposite of the story of tower, the Tower of Babel. Remember, the sin of pride of those people led God to make them all speak different languages and misunderstand each other and to separate into different peoples. They lost their unity when they sinned. Here's a very humorous scene at the conclusion of the book by C.S. Lewis called That Hideous Strength. When the people of NICE, N-I-C-E, it stood for an evil atheist pseudoscientific organization that was about to take over the world and they're holding a celebratory gala and they had a guest speaker and he begins to speak and all that comes out is gibberish because Merlin, the magician, who turns out to be a good Catholic, cast a spell on him and everyone there. And so the speaker begins to speak, and he just speaks gibberish. And everyone is startled and laughs at him, and he's serious, and he goes on speaking, tries to get their attention, but he just speaks this gibberish that no one understands. Other people stand up and try to intervene to calm things down, and they too speak gibberish. No one understands them. People turn to their partners at the table and, and, and start talking to them, and they can't understand each other. They're speaking gibberish to each other. And they start shouting louder and louder to be understood, and no one understands anything. And the whole thing breaks up in confusion. People are angry. They start panicking and rushing for the door. And so ends the domination of the group called NICE. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. People divided by language. Sin divides, the Holy Spirit unites. On Pentecost, all hear the same message by the power of the Holy Spirit. The world is united into one family once again, and one race, the race of the children of God. All mankind is to be united. This is God's will on Pentecost. Into one family, one race, the race of the children of God. We're all made equal before God as beloved children. St. Paul said there's no longer Jew or Gentile, barbarian or Greek, slave or free, man or woman. We're all united in the one body of Christ. Each one has a dignity that we ought to respect. No one's better than the other because of their race, because of their language, because of their talents. We're all children of God, called to the glory of heaven. No one is better than another or less. Again, St. Josemaria said, many great things depend, don't forget it, on whether you and I live our lives as God wants. What does Pentecost 2020 mean to me? God is calling us to aim at holiness, not just to get by, not just to be a nice person, but to be Christ present in society who unites people with our friendship, with our, with our understanding, who brings people together. Christ present in my family, Christ present in my community, Christ present in my place of work, Christ present in the decisions I make, to let the Holy Spirit penetrate my life and root out all sin from my life. Again, St. Jose Maria used to say, we are not just good people joined with other good people to do something good. That's a lot, but still little. We are carrying out an imperative command of Christ on this Pentecost. Christ is looking at us now. Jesus is here with me, virtually with you. The first Christians picked up the challenge. 
We can read from the letter to Dionysus, an early Christian writing that dates from the year around 130 AD, during the year of the Christian persecutions, when their Christians were giving their lives up just for believing in Jesus. And we are facing something similar today at Pentecost 2020, when Christians are needed to stand up. And here's what this person writing to explain what a Christian was. Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or custom. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own, or speak a strange dialect, or follow some outlandish way of life. Their teaching is not based upon dreams inspired by the curiosity of men. Unlike other people, they champion no purely human doc doctrine. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it's Greek or foreign. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse, deference their response to insult. For the good they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors, but even then they rejoice as though receiving the gift of life. They are attacked by Jews as aliens. They are persecuted by Greeks, yet no one can explain the reason for this. To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world, but the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, so Christians are found in all cities, cities of the world, but cannot be identified with the world. Those faithful Christians change the world despite being persecuted because they lived what they believed. They were outcasts. It was hard, they were persecuted, but they lived what they believed. And St. Josemaria used to say, what the devil fears most is when Christians begin to live their faith. What does Pentecost 2020 mean to me? It's a call to all of us to turn inward and listen to the Holy Spirit. Maybe it has been a long time. Tell him, I want to learn to live in your presence. I want you to be my mentor, to accompany me throughout the day. I want to stop and consider each decision I make, first of all, in the presence of God. I need to build up the presence of God as I go through the day so I don't get lost or overwhelmed by moods, temptations, manipulative advertisements, temptations of the eyes. We're called to be right there in the middle of the world in the middle of society, exposed to all the winds and storms and elements of our society, how can I survive? We have to learn to carry our own environment with us, talking to Mary as we go through the day, asking the help of our guardian angels as we get into the car on the subway, praying for others as we walk on the street, to greet those pictures of Mary that we have in our homes and ask for patience and kindness. To turn God to God during the day and say, Lord, forgive me, I did it again. Learn to live with the Holy Spirit within us. We have to end. The Holy Spirit is inviting us to be like those first Christians, men in the world, but not of the world. It is possible. It is necessary. God needs it. The world needs it. And you and I are called to it on this Pentecost 2020. As we spend a few minutes in silence, think how to go deeper in your response to the Holy Spirit.
on Pentecost 2020. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle the hearts of your faithful and renew the face of the earth. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. Good evening, everyone. Let's start with a Hail Mary, shall we? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy Mary, undoer of knots, pray for us. Saint Joseph, head of the Holy Family, pray for us. So, tonight's topic is, can my marriage survive COVID-19? So, you know, obviously these are times of significantly increased stress and anxiety. Calls to counseling center helplines are way up. We have financial worries, we have health worries, job worries, you know, and just fear of the virus itself in general uh, and all that uncertainty uh, combines to create an awful lot of anxiety. Um, I really like, I just came across a definition, I was listening to a podcast by Father Mike Schmitz who uh, many of you may listen to, um, but his definition of anxiety, that was excellent and very appropriate. And he says, anxiety is an overestimation of the danger and an underestimation of our ability to handle it. And it's easy with all the media hype and all that's going on to overestimate the danger of uh, COVID-19, which is certainly dangerous, but it's easy to, to get carried away by that. So, uh, and that creates a lot of stress. And now we're living together with our wives and our families 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and uh, that can create a lot of stress as well. So I want to start with uh, 
uh, something that St. Paul wrote to the uh, Colossians, which I think is very appropriate for our times now. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Uh, if one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you do. So if there's ever a time we need to follow that advice, I think it's now. So I want to talk a little bit about just three of the things you mentioned, patience, forgiveness, and kindness, uh, and the ways we can uh, practice those during these times of uh, involuntary confinement, actually. So patience, you know, the plain truth is we all married uh, an imperfect woman. I, you know, she married an imperfect man, but uh, we may have uh, overlooked a lot of her imperfections <laughs> prior to our marriage. But, uh, you know, now living together 24 hours a day, sometimes those perfections can seem to grow in number and in magnitude. And we're around the children all day long and they're imperfect as well. So it's important to keep in mind, though, that we have a choice. Okay. These imperfections of the people we live with can be a source of irritation for us or a source of virtue, particularly the virtue of patience. So I think a proper attitude to keep in mind is um, we are perfected by other people's imperfections. We are perfected by our spouse's imperfections if we view them in the right supernatural light, okay? so. Um, there are three things, you know, virtue, so Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas said, uh, patience is the virtue that helps us calmly bear our tribulations and preserve serenity amid the sufferings of life. Well, we need patience now. So there's three things we need if we want to grow in patience. First is we have to really want it. We have to see patience as a good thing, so we'll put our effort towards it. Second, we have to pray for it. Ask and you shall receive. St. Bonaventure said, if you would suffer patiently the adversities and miseries of the world, let us hear uh, insert of the pandemic uh, or home confinement, uh, be a person of prayer. All right, so we have to pray for patience. And third, we have to practice it. Patience is a virtue. Virtue is a good habit. And habits only get acquired through practice. And we certainly have a lot of opportunities to practice patience these days. It's important to keep in mind, the virtue of patience gives us joy. Patience makes us happy. The patient man is, awful, is always joyful. Uh, his joy cannot be taken from him. His patience and the joy that results from it is like salt. It makes everything more flavorful. All right, Joy is contagious. If you wish to be joyful, become patient. A piece of practical advice from St. Jose Maria in the way. Uh, never correct anyone while you're still indignant about a fault committed. Wait until the next day or even longer, and then calmly and with a pure intention make you reprimand. You'll gain more by one friendly word than by three-hour quarrel. Control your temper. And one of the things that successful couples do really well is they are able to come back two or three days later and debrief about an argument. They're able to keep it from getting out of control initially, and they're able to come back and talk about it later. So. So the advice from St. Jose Maria is, uh, is spot on in terms of what we're learning uh, these days about what makes for successful marriages. All right, so bottom line, the patience we show in our homes will go a long way to make our homes cheerful and joyful. As a practical idea, I think the morning offering is a good time to focus in on the virtue of patience. It's a good time to sit here and, and Look ahead on our day. What are some things that could happen that could rob us of our patience or that try our patience and get prepared for it ahead of time during our morning offering? Forgiveness. Uh, so this is where forgiveness comes in because we're going to blow it sometimes and our family members, our wife will blow it sometimes as well. And I believe forgiveness is the single most important virtue needed to have a happy marriage and a happy life because we are flawed. Okay. Come into this world with original sin, and along the way, we pick up a few other bad habits like anger and impatience and selfishness, etc. Uh, and family members, you know, we're constantly getting on each other's nerves, and and but but almost always unintentionally. All right, uh, we, we don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, how can I irritate my wife today? Well, that's what I'll go do first. We don't do that, but yet we find ways to do that, or our wife finds ways to irritate us to get on our nerves. But it's almost always unintentional. All right. Uh, it's important to realize that our faith requires us to forgive. It's not optional. 
every time we say the Our Father, we are reminded that our forgiveness from God is tied to how well we forgive others. So it's a critical, critical thing. And in the Our Father, all the virtues we could have asked for, Christ did not say we should ask for faith, hope, charity, humility, uh, purity. It's forgiveness. Forgiveness is the virtue we ask for. We ask that we receive it and that we give it. So it's important for us to be both a giver and a receiver of forgiveness. So what is forgiveness, actually? So forgiveness is a decision. It's a choice we make to overcome the pain that we're feeling by the slight that we've received. It's a decision. It's a rational, conscious decision. It's an act of the intellect. It's a letting go of the negative emotions of the anger, the resentment, okay? Uh, and that one thing will make us cheerful if we can just let go of the negative emotions of the anger, okay? Um, and the, but those are powerful emotions. They're hard to let go of. But we need to let go of those negative emotions. Uh, and third, it's treating the offending party with compassion, even if they don't necessarily deserve it, even if they don't ask for forgiveness. Whether we feel like it or not, but we forgive because it's the right thing to do, whether it's the two-year-old who just spilled her milk or your wife who just snapped at you. So remember, of course, Christ, hanging from the cross, forgave those people who put him there, but they didn't even ask for it. They were spitting on him and making fun of him, and he still forgave them. Okay. So how do we grow in forgiveness? First, we have to really want it. Okay, We have to see forgiveness as a good thing. Second, we have to pray for it. It's the virtue that makes us the most Christ-like. It's the whole reason he came to this earth, was to bring us forgiveness and to teach us how to forgive. Third, we have to practice it. And we have a lot of opportunities each day to practice forgiveness now that we're living together all the time. So in a furrow, St. Jose Maria wrote, to forgive with one's whole heart and with no trace of a grudge will always be a wonderfully fruitful disposition to have. Okay. So that was Christ's attitude, I nailed to the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So practical idea on forgiveness, the morning offering is a good time to get uh, set up to practice forgiveness during the day. Anticipate, you know, who might irritate us during the day. Anticipate who might get on our nerves uh, and get ready to be prepared to forgive the person even before they do something that irritates us, okay? And stop again at noon and dinner. It's like, okay, how am I doing on my quest to practice forgiveness today? And did I do anything today to anyone in my family to whom I should ask for their forgiveness as well? All right, number three, kindness. Uh, Father Lawrence Levesek wrote a wonderful book on kindness. And in there he tells us that kindness thinks of others first. It is attentive to the needs of others. It listens to others. It is generous. It makes sacrifices. It is self-forgetful. It sincerely makes other people feel important. And it does good for others. Okay. Acts of kindness are above all acts of service. So the kindest thing we can do for our family during this period of home confinement uh, is to serve them. And that's what we're to do as husbands and as fathers. Uh, in Friends of God, St. Jose Maria wrote, be very charitable at all times to those around you, uh, starting with the members of your own family, especially if we're around them 24 hours a day. Right? So we should be full of tenderness and kindness towards those uh, who are suffering or sick or who are nervous or anxious or irritable because of their fear around the pandemic, okay? So how to grow in kindness? Well, first, you got to really want to. You've got to see kindness as a good thing. Second, you have to pray for it. Ask for kindness and ask that you be a man of kindness and you will receive it. And third, yes, you practice it. And we have a lot of opportunities to practice kindness right now. So set a goal to do at least one act of kindness for every member of your family each day. It can be as simple as a kind word or taking an interest in something they're doing or helping kids with homework. Practical idea. By now you know where this is going. Morning offering, right? Morning offering, a good time to identify those acts of kindness and to set your day up to be a man of kindness and a man of service to the rest of your family, all right? So those are my thoughts. Uh, I want to finish with just uh, a couple of practical uh, tips in terms of your marriage. Um, and, you know, there's a couple, of, what the research has shown is that couples who enjoy a good, happy marriage do a very good job each day of investing in friendship, affection, and appreciation. All right. So each day, 
they do, they, they work hard to, to deepen the friendship with your wife, to be, to show her affection, to be affectionate towards her, and to show her appreciation. Three practical ideas on that friendship. First, give her 15 minutes a day of undivided attention, just the two of you. Now, if I asked you, are you willing to invest 1% of your day in your marriage? You would say, of course, 1%. That doesn't seem like much. 1% equals 15 minutes. So invest 15 minutes in your wife, just the two of you each day. That's friendship. Number two, affection. Turn towards her and look at her when she speaks to you. One of the most affectionate things you can do to your wife is make eye contact with her. And in fact, the amount of time that couples spend actually looking at each other when they're in conversation is highly predictive of the harmony or disharmony in a marriage. So affection, show her affection by looking at her when she talks to you. And number three, appreciation. All right, I recommend couples, I remember, take out a piece of paper and a pencil, write down all the things about your wife that you appreciate. With not a lot of thought, you'll come up with 20 items, and a little more, you'll come up with as many as 40. I know one guy come up with 60 things he appreciates. Each day, tell her one of those things. Or go out to the drugstore, get a set of these, uh, these blank cards, and they got a sailboat on the front of them or balloons on them. You open up, they're blank on the inside. Each one of those cards, write down something you appreciate about your wife and leave that laying around the house a couple times a week, you know, in front of the toothbrush, by the coffee pot, on the seat of her car. So every once in a while, she'll stumble upon a card, open it up, and it'll say, sweetheart, what I really appreciate about you is, and then you lay it out. That will make her day, and that will strengthen your marriage. Friendship, affection, and appreciation. 15 minutes at night, turn towards her, look at her, let her know what you appreciate about her. I'll end the way I started with St. Paul who wrote, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you do also. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Have a great evening. Alleluia.
I'm going to read a few questions to help us examine our lives with the light of the Holy Spirit. We can start by praying in silence and putting ourselves in God's presence. Do I make an offering of my life to God each morning, getting up at a set time, asking the Holy Spirit to fill my heart with His gifts? Do I foster the desire to have a continuous dialogue with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do I ask for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, who leads me to the joy of encountering Christ, who takes me by the hand to the Father? All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Is it clear to me that the first task of the interior life is to be actively receptive to the Holy Spirit's action in my soul? Do I seek the intercession of St. Jose Maria, whom John Paul II called the saint of ordinary life, to bring liveliness and joy to my family, my work, and my relaxation? Am I familiar with his life, and do I reflect on his writings? Do 
Do I ask Saint Jose Maria to help me love my friends more and to speak to them boldly about God? Do I make his writings known to others? Am I trying every day to rejuvenate my love for my wife and children, not allowing routine to creep in with the passing of the years? Do I ask for the grace to be truly humble, realizing how great a danger pride is to the married life? In matters of personal preference, do I give in? Do I say I'm sorry when I've lost my temper or have been impatient, untidy, or lazy? St. Jose Maria emphasized the importance of household work, saying that its many small tasks can have very real and remarkable consequences. Do I appreciate that this applies to me, not just to my wife? Do I take on the small tasks of household work without complaining, increasing my share of the workload when circumstances require? For example, recent childbirth, or sickness in the family? Our Lord says, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, in the midst of them. Do I pray that there will always be a tangible spirit of serenity and true affection in my home? Do my wife and children know that they are truly loved and understood simply by the way I listen to them? Do I listen with real interest? Am I creative in finding the best way and the right moment to speak with them? Do I frequently spend time with each family member one-on-one? -on -one? What lessons have I learned about this during the time of coronavirus? How do I want things to be better in this regard once the crisis is over? Do I set specific goals for how I want to better live out my vocation as a husband and a father? Do I speak about these desires in spiritual direction? Would it help to take part in a family enrichment course? June is a month dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Am I asking for a merciful heart, capable of compassion for the sorrows of others? Do I go to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so that she may lead me to the most sacred and merciful heart of Jesus? In silence, we can ask God's forgiveness for our sins and grace to grow in friendship with Him.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Next June, the tw next 26th of June, we will celebrate once again the feast of Saint Jose Maria, the founder of Opus Dei. We will celebrate his Dies Natalis, as it is usually said in Latin, the day of his birth to the glory of heaven. And here in our prayer before our Lord, really, truly, substantially present in the host, in the monstrance, we are going to consider some aspects of his teachings, an aspect of his teaching. From him, many of us have learned, as it is the case with all saints, we have learned how, how to learn the gospel, how to read the gospel, how to get into the gospel. We always he always encourages us to get into the gospel like one more character in the scene. And as it happens, as I said, with many saints, saints, it happens also with Saint Jose Maria that his writings and his teaching, his preaching are great guides, great guides to get to know our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, you Lord, true God, yet true man. We find the, the, the foundation of that of our faith in Jesus Christ through God and through man, we find it, well, in the whole gospel, all the gospels. But there is like a summary, or we find like a summary in the first, in the beginning, the first verses of the gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And a few verses later, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And the Word became flesh. And that's you, Lord. The Word. The Word, you who are at the beginning, and you were with God and you are God, you through whom all things were made, and without you was not anything made that was made, and you become flesh. You become one of us, equal to us in everything, except in sin. St. Jose Maria at times uh, 
described himself for he said that he was a poor sin a poor excuse me a poor sinner madly in love with Jesus Christ what a great definition and uh, and maybe I don't know you I well, you and I can say you know well yes I'm a poor sinner I wish I could say the second part Madly in love with Jesus Christ. Madly in love with you. Madly in love with you, true God, yet true man. And he understood, again, uh, when we look at him, which is what his writings are and his preaching, like a guide to get into the gospel, uh, he understood the, this, the humanity of Jesus Christ, your humanity, Lord, with great realism, which, I mean, you are real man, Lord. You are real man. It's not that you can be more or less, but he, 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 he understood your being man, and, and he understood the, or, or he, the, the contemplation of your humanity, he knew how to bring the contemplation of your humanity, Lord, to our daily life. And he discovered, he taught us to discover all those noble realities of our human nature, of our human life. Learn from you, Lord, to man again, and bring those dimensions of your humanity to our own humanity. And one of those, one of those, and that's, uh, we said that we were going to consider an aspect of the life of St. Jose Maria, uh, one of those aspects, one of those dimensions was St. Jose Maria's sense of humor. In, uh, in the way uh, he writes, true virtue, we could say holiness, we could say the imitation of Jesus Christ, that's what true holiness is. True virtue, he writes, is not sad and repulsive, but pleasantly joyful. True holiness, to follow Jesus Christ, to imitate Jesus Christ, makes us pleasantly joyful. And that's a constant we see in the life of saints. In some of them, like, uh, in some of them in a very special way, and that's the case of Saint Jose Maria. When we read his biography or when we hear, when we hear of people who live with him, and uh, we, we can perceive that Pleasant joy. Pleasant joy and, and joy as well. Joy is not the same as sense of humor, but but they are very much connected. They are very much connected because uh, joy joy and sense of humor, you know, sense of humor, we could say, is that ability to discover the comical part of life. And I'm sure that we all have, you know, just considering our life and things, events in our life, and uh, that probably more than once, hopefully many times, we have found ourselves saying, say, well, Lord, you really have a sense of humor. And in order to have a sense of humor, and a sense of humor, the sense of humor we see in, in the saints, which is not the sense of humor, not the sarcasm, not the sense of humor of making fun of other people, a sense of humor, full of charity, 
but when we talk about the sense of humor or, or, or there is always in order for something to be funny there has to be always a, like a double a double perspective of things we can say things are funny when when we find something absurd in them pleasantly absurd uh, and uh, and for that uh, we need like a double vision like I was thinking preparing the meditation like I don't probably they don't exist anymore I'm sure they don't exist anymore that that old toy you know is something that belongs to my generation uh, the tall boy I think it was called the view master uh, which were those wheels that you put in a machine and it had two pictures of the same two pictures taken at the same time with with a camera I guess that had the separation the two cameras had the separation uh, that you had the distance between your two eyes of the uh, and and therefore when you look at them in that machine you should you saw which is what happens normally you have two images you see two images one with my right eye one with my left eye and your brain puts them together and that's and then you get the sense of depth depth you get the three-dimensional view and uh, that's what happened with that machine and that would happen when when we look at things from above when we look at things with God's eyes you have uh, the our vision very much down to earth but then those that same reality that is very much down to earth you look at it uh, with we can say maybe with the relativism or, or uh, I don't know with the looking at things from above with the transcendence of God or and and that same reality we see in that same reality a different dimension two days ago we celebrated the feast of Pentecost and uh, is part of uh, Pentecost or, or considering the coming of the Holy Spirit I'm sure that we all heard and read about the seven gifts gifts of the Holy Spirit and sometimes I think well we know that the first gift is the gift of wisdom and I think that's maybe a very personal idea that that to have a sense of humor or the sense of humor is part of the gift of wisdom without without the help of the Holy Spirit without looking at things from above is difficult to see the comical part of life John Paul II in 1989 had a series of speeches on during the Angelus he went through the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit and the first one was the first ones he talked about was the gift of wisdom and he said that the, the first and greatest of these gifts the gifts of the Holy Spirit is wisdom which is a light which we receive from on high it is a special sharing in that mysterious and highest knowledge which is that of God himself that this higher wisdom is the root of a new awareness a knowledge permeated by charity by means of which the soul becomes familiar so to say with divine things and tastes them and again he continues this sapiential awareness further gives us a special ability to judge human things according to God's standards in God's light enlightened by this gift 
The Christian is able to see into the reality of the world. No one is better able to appreciate the authentic values of creation, beholding them with the very eyes of God. Saint Jose Maria, master of, that was the title of this second meditation, master of good humor or teacher of good humor, a man from whom we can learn to have a sense of humor and, uh, you know, speaking, most of you listening, praying here before the sacrament are young men, uh, young fathers, men, maybe about to be fathers or to be husbands. And when you read the advice he gave to young couples, and in general to couples, uh, were there were pieces of advice with a lot of spark, we can say, with a lot of sense of humor. When, I mean, it's not that they were really funny, but, but yeah, they were funny. When he encouraged young husbands, and not so young, for instance, said, you know, don't, I mean, and all of us do whatever we can, said, you know, don't, don't get too fat. Think of your wife. You know, you have to be in good shape also for your wife. Same thing he said to the, to the wives, to, you know, to the need to be uh, presentable and uh, pretty for their husbands, or when he recommended uh, wives to conquer their husbands day after day, he said, also, also through the food through the food that you prepare. Or little uh, advice to husbands and so for the wives about how to, uh, well, again, his preaching to young families is full of that joy, a joy um, which is very realistic, very supernatural through God and very human through man. Something, a last point for also for our own uh, resolution for us to consider here in your presence, Lord, uh, is uh, or a conclusion, something, so well, a sense of humor and a manifestation of, a, of having a sense of humor, which is so important in family life and in the relationship between husband and wife is not to take ourselves too seriously. Not to think that, uh, again, uh, and going back to the gift of wisdom, that, uh, that light which we receive from on high, especially sharing that mysterious and highest knowledge which is that of God himself, and then this sapiential awareness, again, the words of St. John Paul II, gives us a special ability to judge human things according to God's standards, in God's light. And when we look at what happens in my life, when we look at my great tragedies, with that divine perspective, we realize that, after all, they are not that important. Or, to take myself so seriously, that when we see maybe, you know, a great offense, or when we take some daily domestic difficulty, as maybe I feel very hurt, well, when we look at things again, Lord, with your eyes, something that could have been a uh, maybe quote-unquote, or no so, or without quote-unquote, a tragedy. When we look at it with your eyes, Lord, we see that it's something to laugh at. That it was a silly thing. And 
Maybe it's a good point. Again, learning from Saint Jose Maria to, as we look at you, Lord, to see if I, in my life, if if I know how to turn those tragedies or things that could be tragedies could become tragedies, if I looking at them with the eyes of God, I know how to turn them into just uh, situations, occasions that spice up life. And that when we think of them, after all, we just laugh at them. We go to Mary. Yesterday we celebrated uh, the memorial of Mary, the mother of the church. Mary, who is in the upper room when the, the Holy Spirit comes. Mary, therefore, who receives the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and Mary certainly also a teacher of good humor. Mary, we can be certain, had on this earth and in heaven now has a sense of humor. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Tantum ergo sacramento sacrament of your body and blood help us to experience the salvation you want for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, through God and through man. Blessed be Jesus Christ, through God and through man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be His most precious blood. Blessed be His most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, the Mary Most Holy. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary Most Holy. Blessed be her Holy and Immaculate Conception. Blessed be her Holy and Immaculate Conception. Blessed be her Glorious Assumption. Blessed be her Glorious Assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in His angels and in His saints. Blessed be God in His angels and in His saints. Amen. Holy God, we praise Thy name. Lord, Yeah.